of Jesus, do we release a spirit of revelation upon this meeting? We speak life. We speak light. We take authority over anything and everything that we'd want to disturb in Jesus' name. We bind every spirit of disturbance and we release them to understand the word of the Lord today in Jesus' name. And I thank you for that, Father. In the name of Jesus, Spirit of the Lord, let revelation be upon this meeting in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, people, I've got the wonderful privilege to try to pack 45 years of intercession into two meetings. <laughs> it's virtually impossible. Uh, but what we are going to do is I'm giving today to you the teaching. And then tomorrow afternoon, I also have the privilege to lead the prayer. So I'm this afternoon in the prayer meeting, enjoying when other people are leading. And then tomorrow night, we have to, uh, tomorrow afternoon, we have to put into practice what we learned today because there's no time to, to teach and to learn today. So tomorrow afternoon, that's practical time. Bring your Bible along. Don't come to a prayer meeting with me without a Bible and a book and a notebook. Anyhow. And then uh, we are going to go that way. Now, I've been asking myself very much. <clears throat> do I need that much? It's quite loud. Can I have a sound a little bit down? Thank you. I've been asking myself, what is it that I shall teach you this morning? Now, people, you see this kind of stuff. We can show you, oh, we can show you mass crusades. We can show you where we go into the nations and everything else. But that is not what changed my life. That is not that made me, uh, by the grace of God, the, the icebreaker, call it that way, if you like, or the bulldozer that opened the spirit realm. I want to teach you today what made the difference in my life in intercession. Now, I'm not going to teach you all the, the normal stuff of the power of the intercession and the glory of the intercession and the anointing. Get Reese Howell's book. It will help you. <laughs> so I'm not going that direction at all. I want to take you to the heart of the matter, if that's okay with you. So um, if we, if I want to take, you know, you know, you people know me uh, in the UK. I'm very well known in Wales and everywhere, well, for prayer. So I always say, people say to me, Suzette, so what are you? Are you an intercessor or are you an evangelist? I said, I'm an interceding evangelist. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't care what ticket you put on me. Let's get the, give me the microphone and let's get on with the job. That's just how it is. <laughs> Amen. My, my spiritual daddy, Reinhard Bonke, used to say, let's, let's, let's leave the protocol. Let's get on to the altar call. I like that. <laughs> so I want to take you into what even after all these years of leading prayer through, ah, hundreds and thousands of cities and nations and places, still brought my own life, my own personal prayer life, my own personal time with God into new dimensions. You understand what I'm saying? For us preachers, you know, it's very easy for us to tell people what to go and do. It's another thing for your prayer life to go into a new dimension and then to communicate that. And so I always say, you cannot give what you don't have. It's impossible. You cannot give fire unless you first touch fire. There's no way you can give the flow of revival until you are in revival. There's no way you can bring breakthrough until you yourself live into a new dimension of breakthrough. Then you communicate it. And so I, I want to take you to something that... I think it might be old coffee for some of you, but to me, it's wonderful, and I live it, and it's alive, and I practice it, and I live it out there on the mission fields, because believe me, there, I don't have the blessing of so many people joining me in prayer. You out there, I'm sometimes, sometimes the only foreigner in a radius of what, 1,000 kilometers? So you have to trust the Holy Spirit and you have to feed your spirit. And you have to come to the place of new life or you will not be able to give it to those people. Isn't that right? So I want to take you today to something that spoke to my own spirit a lot. And I wonder, multimedia, if you would be so kind to let's go with the slideshow. I just put a few pictures together. If it works, it would be great. If it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. And um, let's go to, and I, and I want to talk to you today about 
prayer in, in general. Now, I'm not going to preach today, <clears throat> excuse me, on prayer in general, people. That you get on every teaching, YouTube, every book. I want to take you to what would be specific prayer. That which I, I want to lead you into in your intercession, be it at home, or be it at the church, or be it over your city, or be it over your nation, that which is to, to make a way. You understand what I'm saying, people? If it is general prayer, we can go on forever. We can do a conference here for one month without saying the same thing twice. You know what I'm saying? It's, you know, we can go to the prayer of agreement, we can go uh, or something, but that's not where I want to go at all. So when we look at prayer, um, we see that the, the child of God is, first of all, to me, it's very, can we go with the slideshow? We manage at the back? Not yet. Okay. The prayer. Yeah. Everybody give them a clap. Come on. <laughs> all right. I would like that picture up there. I'm just going to lay a foundation right in the beginning. For me, prayer is simply Let's talk to God. It's, it's, it's not a form. It's not a pattern. It's not a method, people. It's not point one, two, and three. It is let's communicate with the Lord like a child would talk to the Father. To me, that's general prayer. And so we see here, excuse me, we see it's not forced. It's not condemnation. It's not anything. It's simply God says, come unto me. To me, communication with God or interaction with God is simply a daily lifestyle of sharing with God and talking to him about everything, good and bad. So I'm not going to go into that. So I just want to give you two or three scriptures just as a foundation, please. In Philippians 4, 6, we says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. No need that you write down, I'm going to go really fast. This is just saying hello. This is not preaching yet. <laughs> so when we see then, for example, in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins and be faithful and just and we forgive us our sins and purify us from unrighteousness. This is scriptures we all know for the general prayer life. Or let's go, for example, Jeremiah 29, 12. When you will call on me and come and pray to me, I will listen to you. So this is just normal God calling us, inviting us to come to him. Now, the one I could preach an hour on, but I wouldn't do it this way, so help me, Lord, not to get distracted. I love Matthew 6.6. 6. I think Matthew 6.6 6 is totally taken out of context. Matthew 6.6 6 says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and, and pray to your father who is in the unseen, then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you publicly. In other words, for many, many years, and I'm not going to go that way. I promise you, just one second, okay? Just two seconds. No, make it one minute. <laughs> the truth is, is that we think we pray and then we expect things to happen. It is what happens in the bedroom that reveals what happens in the public. It is that prayer where it's you and God by yourself and alone. It's that, that is what makes you the man and woman of God that will eventually manifest in the public. So many people go, they have these prayer meetings, or, or excuse me, they have these outreaches, or they have these preaching, or they have the Sunday morning, or they have whatever meetings they have, and they pray a little bit, and then they expect the signs, wonders, miracles, and the revival to flow. It's the other way around, people. You worship your way. You, you are in that prayer room. You are in your private time with God, and what happened there become the outflow on the pulpit. And every miracle, every sign, every wonder, everything you have is actually the result of what has happened in secret where the Lord revealed himself in the open. So that's very important to understand. So it's your private life. It's your personal life. I always say, I, I worship myself into the holies of holies and I declare and pray myself out of that. I come into the place of, I don't pray myself into that holies of holies like they say. I don't. I worship myself in there. And please, people, it, worship has nothing to do with singing. 
Singing is not three fast songs and two slow ones. <laughs> Worship is the expression of your spirit. So when you come into the prayer room and you are at that place in worshiping God in whatever form, if you open your mouth or not, come on, say amen. amen. Has to be because I cannot sing. My singing kills the living and raises the dead. So, but I'm a worshiper. You understand? So I'm going to one day sing in heaven like this woman that sang here. She sang wonderfully. She's only two bricks high, but she sings very beautiful. <laughs> Lovely worship, darling. You blessed me just watching you. I cannot sing like that, even if, if it saved my life. But I'm a worshiper. I worship God. I come into the place until the presence of the Lord fill my spirit, be it with singing or no singing, being in declaring, being in absolutely quiet on my face before God, until the spirit of the Lord start flowing through me, and then I rise up to where the teaching where we are going. You understand? That's the difference. So then when I come from that place and I walk into the stage, then I'm not worried about the anointing. Then I'm not worried about signs and wonders. It happens automatically. So I like to go on with you, and so I told you I'm not going to be, it was three minutes on Matthew, but never mind. Um, but I, I'm going to just simply skip to it, and I want to take you why the word of the Lord says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And it's not preaching. It didn't say it will be a house of miracles. It didn't say it will be a house of preaching. It nothing. It didn't even say it will be a house of good works. Although that's all, if it doesn't I even say it will be a house of, 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 yeah, of, of, of meetings or conferences, although that's all very important, the Lord says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Now, I want to take you away from your normal way of fellowshipping with God, which is fine. I'm not here to say that that is wrong. I think everybody has their way in which they communicate with God and God communicate with them. So I think no preacher has the right to say, this is a right prayer and that's a wrong prayer. I think none of us has that right. I think the Holy Spirit that saved your soul knows how to deal with you. Isn't that right? So let's not get into the religious form of this is right and that is wrong and let's put it in a box. Let's just let the Holy Spirit deal with people in the way he made them, he knows what to do with them. But when it comes to directed prayer, or when we need to actually open the spirit realm or break something through or actually release something into the spirit realm, be it over the nation, be it over your family, be it over your life, be it over your ministry, it's a different story. That is then very focused and that's where I want to take you. Is that all right? Are you used to my funny accent by now? Yes? Okay. I'm also getting yours, used to yours, so it's not so bad. <laughs> and now I want to take you to what really excites me. And it's still an incredible, I, I love it. I live in it. I thrive in it. In this form of prayer that revive my spirit afresh no matter where I am. I like to take you to John, John 1, 1. Now we all know John, the book of John. And you can go to the next picture, to the next, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> I like to go to John, and we actually all know the book of John. And the word was God, and the word was with God. Isn't that beautiful? Um, and we see here, the word was with God. Now, we know that all very, very well. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, are you ready? The sermon just start. Are you ready? The rest, the beginning was only for you to get used to my funny accent and to get used to it that I'm so tall. So it's all right. Are you with me? Yes. Lord, I release the word. 
I release authority and understanding over them. Let this be light into their spirit, Father, and understanding to them in Jesus' name. Amen. And the word was with God. Nothing was created but by the word. Now you say, Suzette, we know that. Okay, let's go there. Let me paraphrase that to you, if you would allow me to. The word was face to face with God. I listened to them singing here today. I'm very sensitive to what people sing. And they were singing the presence of God, the presence of God, isn't it? In the presence of God is freedom, in the presence of God. Now, that's really wonderful, but let me just tell you that in Hebrew, there is no word for the presence of God. In the Hebrew language, the word presence of God does not exist. In the Hebrew language, the word that is used for glory or for presence is the word face to face. In other words, the word was face to face with God. And the word was the face of God. Do you understand? Which means that when you pray and you sense the anointing or you sense the presence of God, that's our language. You understand what I'm saying? What you really say is God is coming face to face to interact with you. That gives prayer a different meaning. That makes, gives worship a different meaning. So when we see, actually, in the, um, the Passion Translation says it very lovely. Let me read it to you, please. In the beginning, the living expression was already there. That's John 1.1 1, 1 in the Passion Translation. In the beginning, the living expression was already there. And the living expression was with God, yet fully God. They were together face to face in the beginning. And through his creative inspiration, the living expression made all things. For nothing existed apart from him. A fountain of life was in him, for his life is light for all humanity, and the light never fails to shine through darkness. The thing I want to point out to you here is the face to face. You understand? And that God was like a fountain. Everything that happened was like a fountain. Now, people, now you have to follow me carefully. Are you with me? Can I go? Can I go a bit faster? Is that all right? Okay. In Genesis chapter 1, 2, we see that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We know that. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was, who knows, was hovering. The Spirit of God was hovering on the face of the earth. Now, if you study the Hebrew language, you will see that that word hovering is compared to a hen that sit on her eggs. So in other words, the Spirit of God was virtually, let me use such language for me as a midwife. My, my profession was, I was a registered nurse and midwife. The Spirit of God, listen, 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 was pregnant with trees was pregnant with light, was pregnant with creation. You understand? Just like a woman that would be pregnant. The Spirit of God was hovering. The Hebrew word there is brewing. The Hebrew word there was, was like a, a hen sitting on her cheeks, brewing out the eggs. The Spirit of God was actually, for lack of better language or a word, Pregnant with creation. Yes? Now, when God come, and we see here, then the creative spirit of God is not only pregnant, but then we see God spoke. Now, hang on a bit. Hang on a bit. Go with me quickly. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3. 
Because this is very, very important that you get this point. I'll spend half an hour on it until you get it. But you must understand this point where we are going. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3, we see, by faith, we understand that the worlds, and I'm reading from the Amplified, I printed it out for me. By faith, we understand that the worlds, during the successive ages, were framed, fashioned, and put in order, equipped for the intended purposes by the word of God, so that what we see was not made out of things which are visible. In other words, the very principle that God taught Abram later to call those things that are not as though they are was already in the beginning with God the same principle. Hello? Are you with me? I'm not always sure because between my German, English, and Afrikaans, and Bahasa, Indonesia, I don't know. <laughs> Did you get that? In other words, the very principle where I want to take you people, which completely revolutionized my life, is actually the very principle that we see in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, that when God Almighty created this earth, even the living God had to call what is not so that the creative spirit of God could create it. Right, let's go. God Almighty, the spirit, the earth is void. Nothing. So God spoke. The moment he spoke, calling that which is not as though they are, according to Hebrews 11.3, the principle of the life-giving spirit of God goes into action to create what is not by the spoken word. Which means that if not even the living God could create this earth without a word, what made you think you're going to have the breakthrough without the spoken word? Amen. Amen. Say to your neighbor, don't worry, she'll come to the point. So now we see that God is calling this. I'm, I'm laying foundations to where we are going because tomorrow night, tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to let you practice this. I promise you from 2 o'clock until the next morning until you get it, if necessary. <laughs> People, I'm a missionary. I have time. No problem. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Don't be scared. It's not that bad. So now we see that God called the earth into existence, Right? Word by word by word. But now, listen to this carefully. Now God speaks and he says, let God said. Genesis 1, 26, yeah? We are again at the spoken word. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and the rest we know. Let them have dominion, etc., etc. You all know that. Isn't that right? God said, in other words, the moment God spoke, God created man by the word. And then he blew life into him. And then God made Adam a life speaking spirit in a body. A life speaking spirit in a body. And when you gave your life to Jesus Christ and is recreated in Christ Jesus, you are nothing else than a life speaking spirit in a body. It has absolute nothing to do with your emotions. It has absolute nothing to do about how you feel or how many hours you prayed or didn't pray. 
It has nothing to do really about how tall or how short you are or who you are, young or old, or how you feel or how you don't feel. It has to do with Christ in you. Amen. So when God made Adam, this life-speaking spirit in a body, who was the absolute next picture? There you see. I just, put it, I just use pictures just as an example for you. Let's please go. God intent for us to soar. I like eagles. <laughs> I just use the eagle. Is that okay? I think we need to soar like eagles. I think, you know, you know, really, birds hide, but eagles fly. And so, God intended for us by the Spirit of the Lord, not by how good you are or how perfect you are or how good you feel or don't feel, but by the Spirit of the Lord to become a life speaking spirit soaring with God, what God has. The whole idea is the next picture, please. Next picture. That's what I want. You, say with me, everything is about reflection. Now come on, say it with a bit more fire, you Welsh people. <laughs> come on, say it again. Say to your neighbor, good morning, say it with more fire. <laughs> Everything in the spirit is about reflection. You are only to reflect Christ. Amen. Amen. When it comes to signs, wonders, and miracles, you are a reflection. You are the extension. When it comes to the word, you are a reflection. When it comes to authority, you're only a reflection. Your authority is only that which is upon the word of God and nothing else. Your authority is not upon this demon, that demon, this, this deliverance, that deliverance. Your authority is based on the cross and the cross alone. Say to your neighbor, she's talking to you. <laughs> Amen, people. We need to understand that our authority is not, you know, how much we, ah, oh, hallelujah, how we bind the narabah, sharaba. I don't care if you roll on the floor or not. I don't care if you have goosebumps or not. I don't care if you shake or not. It's not about how many times we shout and bind and loose. It's about the authority of Christ in the word. So we see here that when God spoke those things into existence, he made Adam his absolute reflection. Can I have the next one? That's my favorite. Ah. This is really what the Spirit of God intended in Genesis. To make Adam the absolute image, the reflection and that's actually exactly what the Lord intend for you and me, including in prayer. We are the reflection of God. We are the reflection of the word. If you and I take responsibility by ourselves of our power, our ability, our anointing, how we feel, that we have a good day, that we have a bad day, that we feel well, that we not feel well, Satan will play havoc with your emotions. Amen. But it's not about that. Because if we take responsibility, I'm not saying we don't walk with the Spirit. You understand what I mean? I'm not saying we don't live the Christ-like life where we follow the Lord, yes. But I am saying that if we take responsibility for the change of the spirit realm, we will fail. Because in your power and in my power, we will never make it. But if we are understanding this principle, say to your neighbor, I'm only a channel. 
Say it again. <laughs> you Welsh people, try one more time. 75% pastor, they're almost awake. Try one more time, come on. <laughs> you are purely a channel. You are a life speaking spirit who was made alive by Christ in you, the hope of glory. So when we understand this and we, we understand that now, now I need to go to the next step. If you understand that this outlawed Lucifer, who was outlawed, had to destroy that connection. Listen, listen. Adam was the heavenly connection, as it is in heaven, so be it on earth. Adam was the connection of heaven on earth to speak life. Adam was the connection of heaven and earth on earth to release that life-giving ability spirit. That's why Adam walked around with God and he called the animals by name. Isn't that right? So we see that Adam had, he had the same that God had, people. Adam was exactly like God. Do not put him in a frame of a normal human being. Adam talk like God, think like God, speak like God, act like God, look like God. Except God was spirit, and Adam was now a life speaking spirit in a body. So now we see that Adam on earth had the right on earth because he had a body. You can only be legal on this earth if you have a body. That's why every demon will try to get everybody's body so that they can be legal. That's why we as children of God give our lives to Jesus Christ and open our, become the temple of the Holy Spirit so that the Spirit of God flows through us legally on this earth as well. Amen. So now, Lucifer, I'm trying to bring this to you. Lucifer has to destroy the connection. And so he needs to destroy the image. And he needs to destroy, and this is the key. Lucifer needed to destroy the life-speaking word on earth. You understand what I'm saying to you? So in other words, he had to destroy that image between heaven and earth. So man could not be a life-speaking spirit anymore because he was dead from within. So whatever Adam spoke at that time was death, was evil. He spoke what his God, Lucifer, was telling him to speak. Well, when you walk with God, you start speaking what God wants to say. That's why I think we need to be so careful what comes out of our mouths because Satan knows that you can get what you say. And this is not claiming, naming, and claiming it. I'm not talking just of positive confession, you understand? I'm talking of life by spirit. So when we understand that, we see that when man, I wrote down here this morning actually, I said when man bowed the knee to Satan, he broke the earth and heaven connection, so the ability to speak on earth back to heaven was broken. The ability to speak on earth life back to heaven, creation, creative power was broken. And that Satan wanted to do because Satan did not want, Lucifer did not want this life-speaking creative ability. Now, when say, Adam really violated or destroyed the heaven and earth link, which was the word, that's why the word had to become flesh. You understand, people? Why is it that the word 
had to become flesh. Because, write down, only an image can restore an image. So for God to restore the image of God back in us, to make us again life speaking spirits in a body, a body that can speak by the inspiration of the spirit again back between heaven and earth, an image had to restore that image. And so because Satan broke this link, he broke the word link. He broke the ability to speak life. He broke the ability to speak creative. He broke that ability. That's why the word link was broken. And that's why the word who was face to face with God had to come and dwell on this earth to restore the word. Amen. To restore that link, we see that God had to do something. Are you still with me? Do you still follow me? Are you with me? Wave at me if you are still with me. They are here. <laughs> okay, let's go on, people. Hallelujah. You know, I, do, I know what to do with the devil, but this is my enemy. Let's go on. Let's go on. So we see now that God had to do something. He had to somehow restore the ability to speak. He had to restore the ability. Remember the Bible says in Revelation, the spirit of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. You understand? So God had to restore the ability of the spirit to speak prophetically, to call again things that are not as though they are, to again start speaking so that God Almighty can start speaking that the Messiah is coming, the Messiah prophecies is coming, so that the spirit of prophecy can start creating the right time for the Messiah to land. Yes? But to do that, the link was broken. So God had to restore the spoken word. I wish I can, if I can only teach Christians this. Let me give the next link, uh, the picture. If I can only teach you that your ability to create in the spirit is much more than what you could ever imagine. You know, I've got a friend, her entire ministry in Germany, her entire ministry, she's not a preacher, she's not even really an, an intercessor the way we know it, she's not, her entire ministry is God give her scripture to declare over Europe daily. And that woman does more for the spirit realm than many people on the stage. You understand? I have nothing against stage ministry, understand me well. But you understand what I'm saying? Her entire calling is the Holy Spirit would give her to pray, let's say, for Finland and to speak the word of Finland or to speak this or to speak that or to speak over the government. Or to speak. Her entire ministry is a bedroom ministry declaring the word into the spirit realm so that the life-giving spirit can make things happen. So, when God needed to restore that, God found a covenant, made a covenant. And we all know the covenant he made with Abram. What was the covenant he made with Abram people? God had to find somebody on earth again who will start calling those things that are not as though they are. Do you understand? So God made this covenant with Abram. We all know in Genesis how he made this covenant and how God came by fire. And God made a covenant with Abram. He found a partner in Genesis 15, 21. 
And in this partnership, God again could work through man to start speaking the word. But Abram could never restore us back to Christ or to God. He could only restore the spoken word. Abram could never restore us because only an image can restore an image. That's why Abram could never be the mediator. Only Christ could be. But Abram made a covenant, and God linked back onto earth through the covenant of Abram. And we all know Romans chapter 4, verse 17. Abram started calling those things that are not as though they are. Where did we see that in the beginning? We saw that in Hebrews chapter 11, 3. That was what God started with. You understand what I'm saying? Yes? God started people in Genesis 1 with calling those things that are not as though they are. Because only by the life-giving spirit can things be created. And now God restored it back through Abram. And Abram starts speaking life. And he starts speaking. He will have those generations. And he look at the stars and he talk about the generations. And so the life-speaking prophetic word is being restored. And that's why we could again have prophets speaking. Speaking about the Christ coming. Speaking about things, and that's why Isaiah would actually be able to come and start prophesying about Isaiah 7 14. Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Now, imagine, people, please imagine with me. Here is Isaiah, he is centuries before Christ, and he gets up and he says, God will give you a sign, a virgin will have a child, and they look at him like, Really, Isaiah? I mean, did you have too much to drink? I mean, you really lost it, my boy. Come on, a virgin will have a child. What nonsense. But the moment he spoke it, the life spirit of God had a word, had a seed to start moving with, moving with, moving with, moving with, moving with. How many of you understand that? That is why we get you people to pray the word. That's why we say, it's, if I'm a pastor, I would get out these prophecies that God has given us long ago. The prophetic word over your church, please let's stop praying the problems of the city and stop praying the problems of the place. Let's start speaking the de destiny of God. You intercessors, I have nothing about you interceding like Daniel for the problems of the nation, but in Jesus' name, make it only 5% of your problem. And get to the 95 where you start speaking the living word over the place. So that when you have a word spoken out under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the word of God in your mouth has the same power than in the Holy Spirit. So when you start speaking this word over your nation, over your church, over your life, over your ministry... If I'm a pastor, if I, I would ask you to write down these prophetic words, write down the scriptures that God gave you already again and again and again and again. How many more prophets must God send to you? But we always want a fresh word, a fresh word. Hallelujah, Lord, give me a fresh word. God gave you so many, you don't even know, you're not even using what you have. Say to your neighbor, ouch. You have to love me. The Bible says so. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying to you people? You understand? God has said again and again and spoken again and again. And now Isaiah come and he prophesy. The moment that under the anointing has now become the word spoken, that word start going into the spirit realm. And the Holy Spirit take it as a seed. And the Holy Spirit start using it and using it and creating. And Isaiah say it and this one say it and that one say it and the one prophesy and the next. And so it carries on until that prophecy manifests in the natural because the ability to speak life again was restored. So 42 generations later, that word manifest. 
That's why in 1 Corinthians 15, 42, can I have the next slide, please? We see that Adam was called a life-giving spirit. If only I can get intercession groups. I have nothing about you praying down your prayer list. I have nothing about us praying different things. I have nothing about us bringing prayer requests before the Lord. This is all wonderful, people. Please understand. That's all part of it. But if only I can take intercessors and prayer, prayer leaders to take the last part of their prayer and to actually go into focused intercession with the word, start speaking things into life, start speaking the things God has said, and see how God manifested in due time. But if you don't speak, what does God have to work with? So in Romans 8, 11, we know, and if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead, sorry, I'm just giving it now because in the second session is, we need to move on. When the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised up Christ Jesus from the dead will also restore your life. Your mortal short lived bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. Please look at me. I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible. Please look at me. I'm sorry. Please look at me. Please. Life in Genesis. Speak. Now that same spirit that was hovering over the earth is now making you his temple. He speak, you speak. Hebrews 3, Hebrews 11, 3 says, he's a fountain, you're a fountain. Doesn't it say rivers of living waters will flow out of you? You understand? He's a life-giving spirit, you are now a, a life-speaking spirit in a body. And you're legal on this earth because you have a body. If you don't have a body, it doesn't matter if you're skinny or if you're tall or if you are on diet or not, it's still you are legal on this earth. You have the right to speak. And if you don't speak, God has nobody else or nothing else to work with, to create with. Now, when we understand this principle right, we see how that goes into intercession. We see that in Isaiah 45, just give me a few more minutes, is that okay? Okay. Just give me five more minutes. Is that all right, people? Then we break. Okay. So Isaiah 45, 26, we see God performs the word of his servants who confirm the word of his servants and perform the counsel of his messengers. The Bible says that. You don't believe it? Let's go for another one. Let's go to Isaiah 57 verse 19. Can we have Isaiah 57 verse 19? Is it possible to have it from the media or not? Or give me the next, the next frame, please, the next uh, picture. Isaiah 57, let's go there, everybody. Let me go there quickly, sorry. Isaiah 57, am I over my time? Excuse me, okay. Isaiah 57, everybody there? Do we have it? Okay. You speak the word, that is what you get. That is Isaiah 55 verse 11. So shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return void unto me but accomplished to what it is sent for. You pray the word, you speak the word, you declare the word, that is what you will have. Amen. Now go with me quickly to Isaiah 57, please. 
Isaiah 57, verse 19. In the Amplified, uh, excuse me, in the King James, the New King James, it says this. 19. I create the fruits of the lips. Peace, peace to him who is far off and to him who is near, says the Lord. And I will heal him. They don't get it. They look at me like I'm from a different planet. Okay, I'm from Papua, but it's not that far. You want peace in this land? You want peace in your family? You want peace in your home? You want revival, don't you? You want to see again the breakthrough in signs, wonders, and miracle and healing? You want to really see again the breakthrough that we had of the flow of the river? That's what it says here. It says, I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him who is far off. Doesn't matter if it's Indonesia or if it's in, in the Wales, Wales or if it's in England or if it's in Uruguay. If you really are serious about peace, you better start speaking it. Stop complaining about the government and spray, pray peace in there. You want to be healed? This is what it says. You want a healing? You want the breakthrough of healing people? What are we waiting for? We are waiting for God to suddenly turn up like the fire will fall and now we're all going to have revival. If that is what you want, you better start speaking it in your bedroom where God sees you in secret so that he can manifest it in the natural. That's why the Bible says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I, I want to quickly come to a close and I want to explain to you how this affected my entire life. Most of you know that Reinhard Bonke had this massive tent. He had the largest gospel tent in the world or mobile gospel tent in the world at that time. Well, I was in charge of the intercession. And I was in charge, I was the, I was the troubleshooter. And so many times I slept with a walkie-talkie next to my bed. Because <laughs> the engineers would wake me up in the middle of the night and say, Suzette, you better start praying, get the intercessors praying. I said, why? They said, because that thing was seven stories high. So on the seven story high, the wind was that strong that that thing was in danger. I stand here on the ground and there's not enough wind to blow my hair. So we walked how many nights through that massive thing that was how many soccer fields size, praying. Praying what? Commanding the wind to be quiet? I tried it a few times. Ah, oh. praying the word over that thing. Because I didn't know what else to pray anymore. Start speaking the destiny of that thing. Because we didn't know, didn't know what to pray anymore. But then we came to the dedication. 17th February, 1984. Was the dedication of that tent. And everybody came from across the world to be part of that dedication. Now before the day... God started giving us a promise. God gave us a very specific promise. And God said that there would be this manifestation of the glory of the Lord, like in the temple of Solomon. So we all expected that. Reinhardt had that word. I had that word in the time of fasting and prayer. And then God did the most amazing thing. God starts speaking to people across the world. And they start writing in people. And they start saying, um, oh, when I was praying for the tent, God gave me the scripture. And it's all the same scripture. 16, 17, 18, 20 people all started writing in the same scripture, the same scripture. And it was like God was giving so much confirmation that we said, thank you, Lord, we heard. But we didn't. That's just the point. 
Look at me. Listen. Listen and hear. Listen with your spirit now. God was not trying to say the same thing 20 times just because God didn't know what to say. God tried to draw our attention to a fact, but we didn't get it. We thought God sent confirmation, but God was not just getting confirmation. Then came the day we all expected this amazing manifestation to happen. In the first meeting, it was not there. In the second meeting, it was not there. Then came the third meeting. Surely God will not be late. And you know what, my friend? We had a good meeting, but it was not there. That specific word was not manifesting. Now, surely the fault can't be with God. But you want to tell me that 20 of us all heard wrong? So I went and locked myself away in a room. I said, Lord, if I can't trust the word, what can I trust? And then God took me to the scripture that set me on this path. And I lived it ever since. He took me to 1 Kings chapter 18. And God spoke unto Elijah and said, go and show yourself unto Ahab. And I will send rain upon the earth. Then Elijah went, he showed himself unto Ahab. And then he built his altar and he slaughtered the balls. And everybody talked about the fire. But the fire was never the promise. Rain was the promise. Fire was the manifestation, a located manifestation of the power and the glory of God. But rain was for the whole land. And after Elijah prayed that fire down and he killed the boss, what did he do? He outran the chariot. People say to me, oh, Elijah was in depression. I don't agree with that theology at all, actually. But anyhow, Elijah outran the chariot of Ahab. He went and put his head between his knees. And what did he pray? Come on, people, what did he pray? Excuse me? Excuse me? I thought he prayed fire. What did he pray? What did he pray? Come on, what did he pray? What did he pray? He prayed the rhema word from God until it manifest. And when I locked myself away there, God said to me, I tried to get your attention. Not one of you prayed that word. Not one of us called that word into existence. Not one of us prayed that scripture. Not one of us released it into the spirit realm. But the spirit of life that lives in us is a creative spirit. I repented. And then I understood all the more what God meant with Psalm 45. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. And you know what, my friend? I start writing. Not because I feel good or because I feel spiritual or because I think I'm a strong intercessor. I start writing in the spirit realm. Then it didn't matter if I travel or if I don't travel. It didn't matter if I'm a preacher or if I'm not a preacher. It didn't matter if I am an evangelist or if I'm not an evangelist. It didn't matter if I'm in a prayer meeting or not. In my bedroom where God sees in secret, I start writing over Papua. People ask me, how come you had such amazing success so fast in Papua? Yeah, the Lord really, really. I would say that in this time we reached good a half a million people at least. Why? You know why, my brother? I tell you. I tell you the secret. There is no secret. 
It was simple. I locked myself away in a room in, uh, in, in, uh, um, in Germany, and I pray. I said, Lord, I have to hear from you. Is it really you that I shall go to Papua? Because it means I have to give up most of my world ministry. I have to give up because it's just impossible with the distances to travel. And I'm going to the mountains. And one night, 20 past 12 that night, two weeks into that fast, where I lie day and night in front of an altar, on the floor crying, speak to me. I have to know. I have to have a word. I cannot go on my own opinion. When I fight every witch doctor out there and all hell is breaking loose, I cannot go on somebody's opinion or somebody's prophetic word. I can only go on the revelation knowledge I have because God is only obliged to confirm his word, not our smart ideas. I must hear. There's got to be more. How many of you have ever heard the revival of Pensacola? Patrick lying on that floor in that church. There's got to be more. And I lie on that floor. I don't care what anybody think. Think I'm a radical. It's fine with me. Think what you like. I don't care. I have to involve heaven into the plan. And I lie on that floor. And I sleep there on the floor. And I wake up and I pray again. Two weeks into that, into that fast, that water fast, crying, there's got to be more. God, I have to hear. Is this really you? Heaven open. And I had an encounter with God. And he said, you are a voice in the wilderness. Every mountain shall become low. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every crooked place shall be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be seen because the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And I knew I, life speaking spirit in me, has to start speaking it. And I close with this. At that time, Gay will tell you, I was in a wheelchair, 18 months. Let me just I take testimony. By a doctor's mistake. And they threw me and threw me in a wheelchair. And I couldn't travel. I couldn't do my normal crusades. I couldn't do my normal prayer schools. I was used to travel 80% of my time all over the world. And now I'm in a wheelchair. Almost 100% of the time, I cannot use my right leg at all because of a mistake of a doctor, which should have been a tiny little operation turned into a nightmare. After the first operation, the second operation, the third operation, they said, we have to amputate your right leg. 18 months where I cry out, God said... Every mountain shall become low. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every crooked place shall be made straight. But I'm sitting in a wheelchair in Germany. I can't go. And I'm in so much pain. And I had only one thing. The Lord spoke to me. He said, Every morning before you wake up, before you eat or drink, take Holy Communion. And so I start taking Holy Communion every morning. And I would say that that is what kept me through the deepest valley. And I would take that bread and I would take that cup and I would say, God, I am in so much pain, I would rather die. But you set every mountain. And I couldn't travel. I couldn't do my ministry at all. Not at all. I couldn't even drive. You know, I grew up with five brothers. If you think I'm tall, you should see them. 
I grew up among five men. God help me, it was total survival. <laughs> and I learned to drive a car from them <laughs> in Africa. <laughs> That's why I'm still wild. <laughs> Anyhow, and now I'm sitting in this car and somebody's driving me and I can hear how that car, oh come on your men, help me. That car is driving in second gear all the way. And all I want to say, change the gears. <laughs> Come on, don't look so holy. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And I think to say, be quiet. They are helping you. They are driving you. You cannot drive yourself. And I can hear how that engine is grinding. And everything in me wants to rise up and say, change the gears. And when I got myself nicely under control, I just said, Feel free to use all the abilities of the gears. <laughs> and you know what the Lord, he didn't say, oh, my sweet girl. He said, Suzette, you see how impatient you are? You see how impatient you are? And I go back home and I repent. And I pray in that wheelchair when they're going to amputate my right leg. And why do I pray? Papa, I cannot go. But you hear the word of the Lord. You hear the word of the Lord. Every mountain will become low. Every valley shall be lifted up. Papua, I speak to you in the spirit. Holy Spirit, create. Seven months into that ordeal, one day I sat on my chair, on my bed, and I made up my mind. And I thought my leg changed and not my calling. And I called the doctor and I said to the professor, I said, Professor, I want permission from you to travel. I want a letter. He said, you want to do what? I said, Professor, I want to travel. I need a letter because I'm a liability on flights. I said, I need a letter from you that I'm allowed to travel. He says, you can't go like that. I said, Doctor, with all respect, you operated my leg, not my head. <laughs> and I start traveling. We start traveling in my own wheelchair. I start having healing crusades all over the world. And God heals the people and God doesn't heal me. And they push me in my wheelchair. And God is healing the people and I'm not healed. But I had one thing every morning with Holy Communion. Every mountain will come low. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. In the second session, I'll teach you what to pray. But you know... And then the 1st of January, yeah? Gail and I, we were in Finland, and I was preaching a New Year's, uh, New Year's meeting, isn't it, in Turku, Turku, and I'm in my wheelchair, and I just got up slowly just to give myself a bit of a rest because I got so tired of sitting, and I suddenly took my first step, and the next one, and the next one, and I'm still running around with the same leg, Hallelujah. Yes, will you clap for Jesus Christ? <laughs> hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And I'm traveling all over Papua, and I'm traveling the four-wheel drives, and I'm climbing the mountains, and I'm having fun, and I don't care if it's through the mud. Every mountain will come low. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every crooked place shall be made straight because the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Will you stand, please?